So Bloom is now away from home in this chapter, and it begins with him walking along the river. And really, this is an opportunity for Joyce to return to that mode of uh, experiencing the world, thinking and responding to that internally rather than externally. He'll have some conversations, but most of the uh, personalization of Bloom in this chapter comes through that internal monologue. He thinks about this funeral that he has to attend at 11 o'clock, and this leads him to thinking about this guy named Corny Kelleher. And this is a very uh, tricky and uh, minor character, but he plays a somewhat major role later in the book, and what he is and how he works and what he represents Maybe that's the key part of what he represents in mythology. I think this early in the book, Joyce was really uh, sticking to the idea of making this mythological parallels a little more strict. As he, as he got deeper into the book, I think he just let loose and took it wherever he needed to or wanted to. But early on, he's still somewhat structured. And I think this character of Corny Kelleher is uh, one example of that in which uh, he works for the funeral director, so he's going to be picking up the dead body and returning it uh, to the cemetery. Or not returning it. <laughs> he's not from the cemetery, but taking it to the cemetery. And that uh, person in mythology who do, does that similar role is the ferryman. How do you say his name? Charon or Charon? That guy. He's like, uh, gets people into Hades, takes, takes them across the river, I think Styx, and uh, gets them, uh, sees that the dead reach their final end. And if they don't pay him a coin, uh, then they, he somehow curses them or something that they walk the shores of Hades for a hundred years. Bloom and everybody else kind of knows that Corny Kelleher is a police informant. And however he got that job, I don't know. Maybe because he's like a funeral guy. He's picking up dead bodies. He probably has to go to a lot of seedy places. I bet the police just started asking him things about the de death. You know, they have to confirm that how they died. But then that maybe he like started like tipping them off and say, oh, everybody says this guy stabbed him or something. I don't know what happened. That's my theory. But um, everybody kind of knows that. But he still is uh, uh, somebody who has an eye on the scene. He, he walks the line between both worlds, you could say, the uh, society of the respectable society and then like the more uh, uh, criminal class society. One thing about him I don't really understand is this song that's associated with him. He'll go, or they'll be talking about something or thinking of something in Bloom's head and he'll go, with my two relum, two relum, two relum, two relum. I'm going to be honest, and the annotations don't really help. It just says a song that's associated with him. I don't know what that means. If he starts dancing or something, what what his deal is. But it's uh, it's kind of unclear. It's a mystery. Last chapter, Bloom refers to his hat as his ha, H-A. And you might have thought that was a typo, but it's actually not a typo. It's intentional. Joyce was trying to show that uh, inside of his hat he has a tag that says something, something hat. And the T had been rubbed off or something. As Bloom walks along, he takes out of his hat this business card, but it's not a business card that says Leopold Bloom. It says Henry Flower. This is going to be, or this is a, a pseudonym or an alias that he uses to conceal his real identity. He put this advertisement in the newspaper for a, a typist to help him in literary endeavors. He gets quite a few responses, but he begins this correspondence and flirtation with this Martha Clifford woman woman and I've heard some ideas some people say that even she is also a pen name and she's a, a woman in the book somewhere and uh, I've heard a few different theories on that we'll talk about that later maybe you'll notice in Bloom's internal dialogue he uses these sentences that have no ending it's almost like he's too drowsy from the lotus eating fielding of the city to even finish his train of thought. The city has, uh, in a sense, uh, interacting with his thought and he can only get so far in a sentence before the lotus takes over. At the post office, he gives his card, his business card to the clerk and she gives him back a letter. This is a letter that uh, he, so he put an ad in the newspaper he got quite a few, I think, like maybe 40 replies. And one of these was from this woman named Martha Clifford. 
he sent a letter to her and telling her about the job, but something in the letter was a little flirtatious because when he gets the letter back from her, it uh, clearly refers to a few things, but we don't know the exact wording of his letter. Bloom gets back on the street outside the post office and he wants to get to the letter, but he uh, is interrupted before he can do so by this guy named McCoy. McCoy is somebody associated with the newspaper somehow because Bloom before said that he would try to get a pass, uh, maybe some kind of train pass, to uh, take some trip and get it paid for by the press office. So he said he'll try and do that through McCoy. When he actually meets McCoy though on the street, all he wants to do is get away from McCoy and read his letter. So he's kind of frustrated. Uh, McCoy asks him a favor though. He goes, hey, you're going to that funeral today, right? He's like, oh, well, I can't go. Why don't you, when you're there, when they ask, you know, in the newspaper report, who was at the, the funeral, put me down. And, and Bloom's like, okay, okay, I'll do that. And I was thinking about this. What does this mean? I mean, first, it's, it's asking Bloom to lie for him, but it's in some sense a white lie. So Bloom is willing to do it. And uh, the people involved with it, like Bloom knows it's a lie. This guy knows it's a lie. And then at the funeral, the guy taking the note knows it's a lie. But they're all complicit in it and it's agreed upon that this is how reality was. Um, I think there's something that Bloom, uh, I'm sorry, Joyce is really trying to show there. A funny part when they're talking in the distance behind, uh, across the street or something, there's oh, another woman that Bloom gets his eye on and starts, tries to check out. But again, he's interrupted by, I think a streetcar blocks the view. And it's just one other example of Bloom being frustrated. But also, uh, we, we know again that he's horny and he's, he wants to masturbate. And we'll learn more about that later. <laughs> We're getting a lot of lead-ins to the newspaper and journalism industries in, uh, in a few chapters. We're going to get that even more, but I think, uh, Joyce is building up to it. And one way that he does that is this insertion of these advertisements that Bloom sees on a newspaper for this plum trees potted meat. And I guess to pot your meat was a uh, euphemism for to have sex. And when Bloom sees that, referring to uh, home being an abode of bliss, he, can, he thinks of Molly having her affair. And uh, so whenever that pops up, it's going to go through his head in, in that way. It's going to have that special meaning for Bloom. One thing I've kind of learned that I thought was kind of interesting is that this a phrase, an abode of bliss, I've been, uh, I read through this book by Madame Blavatsky, who I, I'm not a fan of her writing style in general, but uh, she uses that phrase in one of her books. I think Joyce will parody or mock her a little in uh, a few of the chapters in this book, maybe uh, the chapter at the library with Stephen's lecture and also the Q&A chapter later, later in the book. But that phrase, an abode of bliss, I read through the key to theosophy and it was in there. So I think Joyce was just kind of uh, using that for his own purposes. 